As we admitted, we were powerless over alcohol and then our lives had become unmanageable. And I, while I, this was really kind of hard for me, I, I hadn't seen that many major impacts to my life from my alcohol and drug use. For me, I was a marijuana addict. That was my main drug of choice. And I hadn't lost my job. I hadn't been arrested. I hadn't lost my family yet is, is what I tell myself now. I was heading in that direction. Um, it was the pandemic had just started. I was working from home. I had all the free time in the world and didn't have to go into the office. And I started to, to use more and more. And of course I was, well, maybe not of course, but, but I was hiding this all from my friends, from my wife, from my family, um, or at least trying to, I thought that I was doing a pretty good job of hiding that. Um, but as most of us who are addicts and alcoholics know, we're never as good at hiding it as we think we are. Um, and so it got to the point and just a little bit of a backstory. My wife, um, her mom, or sorry, her dad was, was an addict and left them when she was left her mom when she was like three years old. And so all of our married life, like she had told me, it's like, listen, the one thing that I don't want you to do, I don't want you to continue to use drugs. I, this is one thing I can't stand. It's, it's ruined my life, my family's life up until this point. I can't, I can't deal with that. And so I told her, okay, I'll quit. You know, we, she knew that when we got together, I was, I was using drugs and things like that. Um, and I promised her I would quit. And of course I didn't, I, I lied and, and tried to do it behind her back as much as I could. Um, and, and it got to the point, especially during that, that COVID year where I was using every day and multiple times per day. And she gave me the ultimatum. It's like, listen, you either stop and go to rehab or I'm, I'm taking the kids and we're out of here. So of course I made the decision. It, it didn't take me a long time to, to decide. I was like, listen, we're going to find out, um, you know, where, what I need to do, where I need to go. We actually reached out to, to, to Andy and, um, and trying to figure out like where, where are the best rehabs in Atlanta to go um, through Karen, Karen's network. Um, and we, we settled on Talbot rehab, which was like an inpatient facility down by the airport. And we went there, I was there for a month. Um, and while I was there, I kind of leads into step two. Step two is we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For me, I've always been a Christian. I grew up in the Methodist church while I, you know, in college and just out of college, I kind of fell away from the church and got out of going to going to service every Sunday. I was still always a Christian. I still always had God in mind. But it really, this is kind of where the story gets interesting. This is where um, God really showed myself, showed himself to me. Um, we were doing, as part of like uh, our radical mentoring group, because I had been involved in radical mentoring even before I got into rehab. I was still using and still doing that even through radical mentoring some, unfortunately, which I always had some regrets there, of course. Um, we were doing a Bible study when I was like the first weekend I was in rehab doing one of those 10 day devotions in the Bible app. And as we were going through the comments, I, I was mentioning how I felt really down on myself. It's like, how did I find myself in this place? This is awful. I can't believe I'm, you know, I'm 40 years old and stuck in rehab and my family's at home. And Pat had actually mentioned something about, you know, you should read Psalm 8, um, which I'll read now, because, or at least the, the, the verse from Psalm 8 that, that he pointed out was, um, you know, what, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? Because I thought God had just forgotten about me. I was like, why am I even here? Does God really care about me? And, and Pat reminded me through that verse that, no matter where we are, no matter what we do, God is there for us and God is thinking about us and God cares for us. And I was like, okay, that's, that's that really made me feel a little bit better. That was great. Well, later on that same morning, less than two hours later, I was having a conversation with my mom, telling her similar things, how, you know, I still felt kind of down on myself um, and hung up the phone with her. She called me right back, like within 30 seconds. She's like, I don't know why. But something told me I needed to call you and tell you, you need to read Psalm 8 and, and go through that verse again. And, and I was like, what? That's crazy. And it was like less than two hours later, I had two people remind me of this exact same verse. And this, you know, of all the Bible verses, it was the exact same verse. And I was like, well, that's that's really amazing. I I can only say that that was God speaking to me and, and telling me that that I am valued. No matter what I go through, like he has a purpose for me and for my life. So the third step as we move on is uh, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understand him. And again, this is really hard for me and it's hard for many of us because we have, we've been taught that we need to be self-reliant. We need to do everything ourselves. 
that, you know, we're, we're good at our careers because we worked hard. We're good at life because we worked hard. But I really had to turn everything over to God and learn to turn everything over to God in order to, to beat this addiction. And that's what I had to do. Um, and obviously, as you guys, you guys may or may not know, but in addiction, we never truly recover. We're, we're always working towards it. So every day I have to give my life and my will over to God in order to continue to, to stay within the lines and stay in this program. And to do that, I, I I picked a sponsor. I even picked a sponsor that I wasn't really sure of. He was younger than me. He didn't have any kids. He, uh, you know, I was like, this. I can't believe I'm I'm doing this. I don't. How can I trust this guy? But for me, that was my decision to turn my will over to God. I was trusting God. I wasn't trusting him. I was trusting my higher power, my God, to lead me through him and through the people in my group. And so that was a big step for me. Uh, step four is make, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Um, this is something that it was not easy to do. You go through and look at yourself and look at like, what are the character defects that that I have? For me, a lot of it was selfishness. Obviously, I you know, no matter what, I always wanted to feel different than I was. I wanted to feel good and feel happy. Um, I, I wasn't willing to to deal with those hard things in life without the use of drugs or alcohol. Um, so that was one way that I was selfish, but I was selfish in so many other ways. When I think about all the stress and uh, the worry that I put my wife under, I can see now how really selfish I was. Um, and then, you know, when I think about all the the other, the, the, my, my need for pleasing others, I was always a, a people pleaser. So no matter who I was around, especially if I was around people that maybe were bad influences, I still felt like I had to please them and go along with the flow, go along with the crowd. And that's kind of how I got into this mess in the first place. So those are just a couple of examples of the, the character defects that I found within myself. And then five, um, admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. So that's when I told these defects to my sponsor, to other people, just like I am today, um, and continuously looking at myself and, and saying, you know, th these are the things that I need to work on. Um, it, it really helps to get that out in the open. And it, it truly became like the first time that I was honest with somebody else. I wasn't keeping it in anymore. I wasn't isolating. I was telling other people and getting it out in the open. And it was, it was game changing. It was amazing. If you guys had the opportunity, do it because it feels so good to get those things off your chest. Number six, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. That's, it sounds obvious. I was like, what? I, I should, you know, we should always want to have these defects removed, right? But the more I think about it and the more I've gotten into this program, you realize that some of these defects you really want to hold on to. It's hard to let go of. Like we like to feel like we're in control, right? We want to feel like we have control over our lives and not give our will over to God. That's that's a character defect that I had. And it's it's so easy to hold on to. Um, we we don't want to give our will over to God as much as as we we should because it, it, we we want to feel like we're in control. So that's just one example of that, but something that I continue to deal with on a daily basis. And then seven, finally, the, once you're ready to have God remove these defects of character, you humbly, humbly, which is the key word there, ask him to remove these shortcomings, not just because it'll make me a better person, not just because it'll you know make me look better to other people, but because it's, it's really what he wants me to do, what God wants me to do, and, and we'll actually further his um his goal in the world and, and his light in the world so it's again unless you're humble about it unless you re are really doing it for the right reasons god is not going to remove these defects of character for me that's what i found so it's humbly asking him is, is the, really the key to that step and then number eight made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all Essentially, this is just writing down the names of everybody that we that we harmed or we felt like we harmed, even if it wasn't apparent to them. Um, obviously, my wife was and my parents and my children were on the top of that list. But I had like all of my radical mentoring brothers that while I was dedicated and devoted through the the, the, the year that we went through together, I wasn't completely there where my head wasn't completely in it. And so there was a lot of people on that list that may not have known that they were impacted, but I knew and so I wrote those names down and became willing to make amends to them if if I could. 
Um, and then finally, in step nine, you do make direct amends to those people when possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And so there's there's people that you put on the list, like ex-girlfriends, you might not want to go back to <laughs> talk to. They say, my spot's just like, yeah, maybe you don't want to go back and talk to your ex-girlfriends and things like that. But at least for the people that you know, like for me, um, you know, my friends in, in, in here and some of my friends from college, which, which were easy to do. My wife was obviously a very hard one to do, but it was very impactful. And I, I remember spending a lot of time sitting down with her and, 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 and it's not about asking for forgiveness. It's not about, um, it's not expecting to be forgiven. It's, it's really just recognizing that I did wrong and that I can make changes to be a better person. And, and hopefully through living a better life, I can make those what we call living amends every day to make them realize that that we are changing. We're not going to be ever completely changed, but that we are changing and that we're working towards it. Uh, step 10 is continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, promptly admitted. And like I said, every day, I have different character defects that pop up within me every day. I have to realize that there's some amends that I probably have to make, whether I was short with my kids, I, you know, or, you know, got, got into an argument with Melissa or, you know, even maybe cut corners at work. There's every day, there's an opportunity to realize that, that I could be a better person and a better disciple of God. Um, and then make amends to those people as quickly as I can and say, I'm sorry, say, I'm sorry, not accept, not, not expecting to be forgiven, but to let them know that, you know, that you had done wrong or that I, that I had done wrong. And then 11 sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God. As we understood him praying only for the knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. And I've actually used that in closing prayers in here before. I think whenever I pray, I pray to God, it's like, just tell me what your will is for me today. Not what my will is, not what I want to do, but what's your will for me today? And give me the power to carry that out, or at least the strength and the energy to carry that out today. So that's one prayer that I do every day is just tell me what you, tell me what you think that I should do. And, you know, some days I do it better than others, but I'm always trying to think about God's will for my life and not my own. And then finally, step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics or addicts and to practice these principles in all our affairs. And this is kind of where I finally found a purpose to my life. I, you know, I've been searching all my life for whether it was a career or, a, you know, what, what, what am I going to do with my life? Um, and now that I'm able to share my story. I've sponsored other guys in the program through AA. Some one guy that's with me now is like 65 years old. And, you know, I would never have expected to be working in the life of somebody who's 20 years older than me and, um, and helping him stay sober for over a year now. It's been really, that's been the most rewarding thing that I've had in my entire life. Um, and, and so I, while I was so bummed out, like when I was talking about that, that day in, in rehab, that first weekend, when, when Pat said to read Psalm 8, I was so bummed about where I was in my life. Now I look back on that and say, wow, God gave me a gift to help others. And, you know, while it wasn't maybe the, the path that I would have chosen to take in from day one, I, I wouldn't have done it any differently now. Um, I see it as a, as a means and a, and a, I guess a mission for me, or at least have a purpose in my life now that I can share with others. And, and all I have to do is share my story. I don't have to do anything special. All I have to do is be me and I can hopefully help others that have gone through the same things or similar things that I have. So thank you guys for letting me share. I know I'm pretty much up on time, but, um, and unfortunately I actually, I have a call at seven 45 or seven 30. I have to get back to, so I won't be able to stick around, but if you guys have any questions and want to talk later, I'm always open and available. Um, I, I'd love to, to share more about my story and, and the AA program if anybody has any questions, but um, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for letting me talk to them. Well, thank you. Let's thank Rob again. And uh, Jerry, do you want to you want to come up and share a few words with us also? Thank you. About 
Well, this is more than active all, huh? Hold on a second. Well, I'm Jerry Ray, and I'm 88 years old, and generally I'm the oldest guy in the room, and that ain't bad. Except that our traditional service on Sunday morning here, there's people there older than me. We, we honored a lot of them this past Sunday. I was born and raised in Ennis, Texas, 1935, and I was raised in a Christian family, a Southern Baptist Christian family. And I was one of those children that was drugged to church twice on Sunday and sometimes Wednesday night. Uh, for prayer meeting. We had a lot of rules. The Baptists had a lot more rules than Methodists. No liquor. No dancing. No picture shows on Sunday. I never understood that one. Why well, it was a bad thing. It wasn't bad on Saturday, but it was bad on Sunday. I was trained to know better. I was trained to know that God loved me and he would never forsake me. That was very comforting. I married my high school sweetheart just before my senior year in college. Beverly was a Methodist, was a Methodist but she joined the Baptist church while we were in College Station, she was dipped. She was baptized. Out of college, six months on active duty in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. First real job was in Odessa, Texas, where all that oil is in the Permian Basin. I was a trainer in a high school there. Still going to a Baptist church. Very active in our Baptist church there. Had a chance to go to work for the Los Angeles Rams in 1967. That's when George Allen was coaching there and the fearsome foursome were big and Roman Gabriel was quarterback. And that was pretty nice, pretty neat job. But that's where it first became difficult to attend church. And it was there actually when John was baptized into the Baptist church in California while we lived there. In the NFL at that time, we began, we always started training camp July the 5th, probably, is about when we started. And the next off day was somewhere around Christmas. So that was seven days a week for six months of the year. So you had a reason that you couldn't go to church on Sunday. And that was about the time of the beginning of my slide. Came to the Falcons two years later, 1969. It was the same. You can't be involved in church for six months. We did live in Decatur when we first came here, and we were members of the Decatur Baptist Church there for a while, but uh, then we quit going as much. Couldn't go during the season. We Quit going in the off season. Uh, you can excuse yourself from that. You know, it's easy just to say, well, I, it's just not really important. So we begin to lose that discipline of going to church. Besides all that, the locker room in the NFL is uh, full of young, very healthy boys. And boys will be boys. Kind of like, you know, when you were in the service with young men in the service, uh, it's not a healthy atmosphere sometimes. Uh, the language gets a little rough. The jokes get a little rougher. The stories are even rougher than that. First thing I know, I'm using their language. And I'm listening and telling their jokes. I knew about I knew it was I was wrong. I knew better. Eh? But it was just a guy thing, you know. It's that all. I really wasn't a very good person. But I excused it. You know, I don't know if people at work knew I was a Christian. 
I never really gave him much reason to suspect I was. So let me change pages here. So we quit going to church altogether. You know, we needed time at home. We needed some time to ourselves. Beverly worked 30 years too, and it was just easy to stay home. And uh, that went on 27 years. But I kept excusing myself. I know that I should be doing better. Man, I love my job. I'd like to do it all over again. I love my job. It was fun. Game day every week for six months out of the year, five months out of the year. And then I slid 27 years. I got totally out of the habit. In 1995, I moved from the training room to upstairs in administration. And I had Sundays off when the team was on the road. And I did have an opportunity to go and about that time, John and Diane had given us two grandchildren. And they'd moved to Dunwoody and they'd joined the church here. And when the kids got a little bigger, they started participating in the church choir here, the soccer games here. The children led us back to the church. Old story. The more we came, the more we liked Wiley and we liked the Woody Methodist Church, so one day we joined. That's when I found out there's a big difference in Methodist and Baptist in the Ten Commandments. I figured after a year of sitting through services here that the Methodists dwell on thou shalt. Oh, goodness. The Baptists dwell on thou shalt not. There's a lot of things we just can't do. And I liked it here better because it seemed like I left here feeling better about it than being whipped to death. And it was, uh, it was a great revelation. But while we were beginning to work here in the church, some, we were meeting people our age. We were meeting friends here that weren't at work. Both Beverly and I, and we both had work, work uh, habits for many years. We took the disciple courses and we began to serve Wednesday night suppers and we met more people and we started going to uh, the Hall of Famers, the old retired men, which still operates once a month, I think, here, but I don't go to it anymore. It was a bunch of old men that had been the pillars of this church and built this church and they were like me now, old and and uh, trying to find something to do. They were great people. I, we had one guy that, you know, I remember at his funeral, I sat at the table with him many, many days, and he was just the biggest, kindest man. I found out at his funeral, he did 25 bombing missions over Germany during World War II. Never mentioned it. I didn't know he'd ever been on an airplane. Things like that. Uh, we worked at Habitat. We delivered flowers. We uh, we visited members of our church that were in the hospital. We served on a great day of service. I was on the trustees for a while, and before I knew it, we slid back into service, slid back into the church. So now that Dunwoody United Methodist Church is a gathering place of new friends. It's a new focus. I know when we lost Beverly in uh, 2011, this church came around, our family supported us. It was a wonderful thing to have someone that cared, that really, really showed up and, and cared. You know, I love this meeting every Tuesday morning. I love seeing you younger men that have assumed the leadership of this wonderful church. I love the preview of what next Sunday summer sermon is going to be. I love our table that we have every week of grumpy old men. 
who most days don't get to the end of the questions, but we solve a ton of, ton of world problems while we're over there. But here's the best part of this long story of slipping away. All the time, God and Jesus didn't give up. They promised me a seat somewhere in heaven because I believed. What a wonderful thing this is. You know, you can't build, beat a deal like that God's promise. My question to you this morning, when have you slid? How'd you get back? I have just one other bit. I got to share this because it irritates me. I started cleaning out many, many boxes for John so he and Linda wouldn't have to do it all when I'm gone. I got rid of like 12 boxes of these big storage boxes and stuff. I even had a copy of my 1957 income tax return the first year we were married. They have names for people like us. But I did find this. This was written, written you know, young people, this was a typewriter. We had typewriters in the day with ribbons that jammed. And so it was an article I had done for um, a Sunday school class when I was in Odessa. I was probably 25 years old. And they asked me to speak, and I was scared to death because I was speaking to older people like y'all. And... Uh, but the name of it was The Art of Getting Along. So I read that. I read it. Man, that's, that's not bad. That's not bad. I, I did that pretty good. It had a lot of suggestions for getting along. And then I realized I wrote that 63 years ago. Then I realized nothing's changed in 63 years. We still don't get along. It's us and them, and I don't like that. Thank you for your patience. I appreciate the opportunity to speak.